how are you? Hey, I am so good. Oh my goodness. Nice. Yeah, my daughter graduated high school this weekend, and all of our family and friends came and celebrated her, and the sun is shining, the school is out for the year, and it just feels like we have arrived. We have arrived at the part of the year where we can kind of rest a little, and it's just been super fun to, like, well, one, it was fun to celebrate, and two... This sounds terrible. It, I, I'm not denigrating the celebration. It's nice to have the celebrations over with and just be resting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That totally makes sense. Those times of transition, especially when they're big transitions, are so exciting. But there is something that brings you back to rest in the quiet moments after them that is equally good. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My daughter had a couple of friends stay with her last night and they took it really easy today and they didn't really get up and well, I don't know when they got up, but they didn't leave the house until like 1230 this afternoon. And my daughter was like, Oh my gosh, it was nice to just have a super slow morning. We've been going, going, going. So yeah, it's nice. hundred percent. So how are you? I am doing pretty good. I feel like I have an oddly quiet life this week. Uh, My daughter is away at church camp for the week. My wife has a residency this week, so she teaches in a master's program that has an online program, and all the online students come together once a year, and it is this week. And so her days are like 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. much of this week, so she's still home, but I'm barely going to see her. And so... I just feel like I am, I have a giant list of things I want to do to try to catch up on a host of different projects and things that I want to get done. And I'm hoping I get them all done by the time the week is over. So I think that's good. I think I'm doing, I'm hopeful. Let's say, let's say that I'm hopeful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Monday, as we record today, it is Monday and Mondays are a good time to be hopeful for your checklist. Mm. Yeah, I read a post from somebody this week that said they hated Mondays, and I am not in that space at the moment. I like Mondays, though I often feel overwhelmed on Mondays. Mondays is my, I've got too many things to do, and they haven't all settled into spots in the week yet today. Mm. So, But uh, you, you didn't call about scheduling. So what's on your mind? Yeah, so... I texted you earlier on about an amazing quote from a book that we're both reading. So this should be fun since like we've done all the prep needed to have this conversation. But this is our book, Reversed Thunder, Eugene Peterson's book on Revelation that we are reading for our Revelation series that will come out in October. So this quote isn't particularly about Revelation. This is much more about John, the author, and who Peterson says he is. And he kind of says he's he's kind of three persons all in one, theologian, poet, and pastor. And the way he articulates this in this quote is just amazing. And it hits on a lot of the themes that we deeply care about on this podcast. And so I'd love to just read this quote and then just stew in it for a while and kick it around, talk about what it all means, uh, maybe even dig up some of the other quotes that Peterson has in this chapter about who St. John was and and these three offices of poet, theologian, and pastor. I just think the whole thing is amazing. That's great. Yeah. I, I thought this was a fascinating quote. And to put it in context just a little bit before you read it, He starts this first chapter off, like you said, as an introduction to who is John and why is he writing this, trying to understand why do we have this weird book, (laughs) right? Yeah. Um, The book of Revelation is very different. So what is it about John and his context that led him to write this kind of book instead of like the letters like Paul wrote or 
kind of a sermonish kind of thing like the author of Hebrews wrote or whatever. He could have written a host of different things, but instead he writes this book that has all of these incredible images and this really intense metaphors. And uh, it just, it's gripping and engaging and it captures your heart and your imagination. And, and so why? Mm -hmm. And it's these, this intersection of these three, uh, what you called offices, which is, I think the perfect word for this, that sets us up to understand why John would write this book. And so with that said, why don't you go ahead and read the quote? Yeah. So it's only, it's, I don't know, five or six lines here. So uh, here it is. A theologian takes God seriously as subject and not as object and makes it a life's work to think and talk of God in order to develop knowledge and understanding of God in his being and work. A poet takes words seriously as images that connect the visible and the invisible and becomes custodian of their skillful and accurate usage. A pastor takes actual persons seriously as children of God and faithfully listens to and speaks with them in the conviction that their life of faith in God is the centrality to which all else is peripheral. Wow. Mm. Peterson is both eloquent and very wordy. Yes. I will make sure that either the day this comes out or the day after this quote gets posted on our social media accounts and gets pinned to the top of the account so that if you're coming back and looking at this later, you have access to the quote. That would because be great. It's such... I get six words in before I'm like, okay, let's stop and talk about that. Yes. Yes. Which is kind of why I wanted to actually have this conversation. I'm like, there's so much to unpack here. So before we kind of, I don't know, not necessarily line by line, but maybe at least office by office, talk about this, what strikes you from this quote? Well, the thing that I think is the most interesting for me, if we're going to go that direction, if we're going to go the office by office route, I think the thing as a preface that becomes very important is the rhythmic use of the phrase takes seriously. Yes. Right? A theologian takes fill in the blank seriously. A poet takes fill in the blank seriously. And a pastor takes fill in the blank seriously. This is striking to me because I think it is worth recognizing that our fulfillment of certain roles is not in so much what we do as what we take seriously. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, as someone who my job was pastor, right? Like that was my job for 20 years. It's easy to think of pastor in terms of business language like KPIs, key performance indicators, and measurable outcomes in terms of behaviors and doing. And who you are is not what you do, but it is what you take seriously. Well, let's start there. Maybe we'll go in reverse order here. Eugene Peterson says, uh, uh, what does a pastor take seriously? He takes actual persons seriously as children of God and faithfully listens to and speaks with them in the conviction that their life of faith in God is the centrality to which all else is peripheral. In other words, they t he takes people seriously and speaks with them in the conviction that their faith in God is central and everything else is secondary. Well, and so much more, right? This is not just, I think Peterson is being very specific here based on some other things that he's written. It is not that he takes people in the aggregate seriously. It is that he takes actual individual people seriously. Yeah, I think that's why he says persons rather than people. Yes, exactly. You know, it's so easy, and this is something that Peterson borrows from Bonhoeffer's book on community. What is that book called? The Little Tiny Book on Community. Oh, right. Life Together. Life Together. There we go. Bonhoeffer is the first place I encountered this thought, and I'm guessing so did Peterson. 
that one of the great dangers in the faith is that we are going to love the concept of people, but actual people with their annoying foibles and frustrating habits, their silly anxieties and foolish hangups and immaturities and all. It's so much harder to love regular, ordinary, everyday people than it is to love the concept of people. It so is. Uh, Well, and this is where I love the fact that Peterson puts listen and talk in the order that he does. Mm. People who love actual persons tend to listen first and talk second. And again, maybe I'm reading too much into Peterson, but I think that order was on purpose. I agree. I mean, you and I have both read a lot of Peterson, and I think that's absolutely intentional. And and what do you think? I just thought it was interesting. Of all the places to put the word faithfully in this sentence, he he says pastors, he doesn't say pastors are ones who faithfully speak the truth. He says... Pastors are the ones who faithfully listen. What do you think the word faithfully means there? You know, I took a class in seminary on pastoral counseling. And so it was not, here's how to be a counselor, but it was, you know, pastors do a lot of counseling light, if you will. And so Mm -hmm. here's how to do that well. Here's how to know your limits and know when to refer And here's how to just kind of set a limit and say, we can spend a couple of sessions talking, but if if it's going to go beyond that, it probably exceeds my ability to deal with it anyway, and I need to refer you. Anyway, it was a fantastic class. But oddly enough, the number one thing I got out of this class, because it was probably said in every single class period, was that most of the magic here comes in just showing up. The power of showing up for people is so, I I want to say medicinal, it's so healing, it's so powerful. And I think that's what Peterson is talking about here. Peterson spent, was it his whole pastoral ministry in one church? Yeah, I think so. I don't think he was ever at any other church. I mean, he was early, early on, I think he was like a youth pastor in New York or something. I forget. Right. Like once he actually planted the church that he was at in Maryland. Yeah. Um, I don't think he ever went anywhere else. So I don't know if it was like 40 years, but roughly that amount of time that he spent in one place ministering to one congregation, continually showing up for people. And I think mm-hmm. that's what it means to faithfully listen, it is to constantly mm. show up for people. How does it strike you? You know, I like your answer. I don't know that I had a good answer, but this idea that faithfully listening means I listen, and then tomorrow I listen again, and then a year from now I listen again, and then a year after that I listen again, that there is a faithfulness, a consistency a sameness in my listening, even if you're complaining of the same problem the night for the 19th time, I've chosen to love you. It's okay. I accept you as you are. I am not only going to accept you if you become who I think you ought to be. I just accept you and I love you. And so I listen and I listen and I listen. And that's where I feel like, I mean, it comes right back to the beginning of that sentence for me. That's what it means for a pastor to take an actual person seriously as a child of God. Mm. And I love mm-hmm. that. I actually am drawn to that as a child of God, right? This isn't, I'm going to take you seriously as a lost soul in need of redemption. I'm not going to take you seriously as a wayward sheep that needs to be brought back into the sheepfold. I'm going to take you seriously as a child of God. There is dignity, there is honor that is starting at a place of acceptance and familiarity. We start as family. Mm -hmm. We're both children of God. And then from that point forward, I can listen to you, I can respect you, even if you've got 
a thousand warts. I just I really appreciate the idea that he's uh, taking a person seriously as a child of God. Well, and it puts bumpers up on the pastoral role, right? Being pastor does not mean I'm your father. So I should not be adopting a fatherly tone. I should not be telling you what to do as if I were your dad. I have some authority. On no level would I ever want to limit that. We've talked about that in several previous episodes. But I'm I'm always recognizing you're a child of God. Yeah. So how do you see this pastor role being differentiated by Peterson from the theologian role? Ooh. Because even sometimes my own definition of a pastor would kind of bleed into this theologian idea. Because he says a theologian takes God seriously. Well, doesn't a pastor do that? So what's the difference here? A theologian takes God seriously as subject and not as object and makes it a life's work to think and talk about God in order to develop knowledge and understanding of God in his being and work. What do you make of that? Yeah, you know, as you're reading that, the image that comes to my mind that kind of encompasses all three of these roles is that on the one hand, and this comes out of the idea of being a priest or a bridge builder. On the one hand, the pastor is reaching out to actual individual persons and trying to know and understand them well. And on the other hand, the pastor or the, this individual is reaching out to God, trying to know and understand him well. And standing in the middle, this person is a theologian on the one hand and a pastor on the other hand, and it's in the act of being a poet that he brings them together through his own intentional communication. Oh, man, that is an awesome image. Dang. All right, I'm going to let you do the rest of the episode. I got nothing else to say. I can't top that. Uh, Yeah, right? Uh, Well... And no, but does that make sense? It totally does. Uh, you know, was it Brennan Manning or who was it that said like evangelism or preaching or something is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread? Oh, that I don't know exactly where that was found, but I first read it in Manning, I'm sure. And I just love that quote. And I think that to me is I'm naming the person in the middle. It's a beggar, mm. right? The yeah. the beggar is looking toward God and just trying desperately to understand God, not as an object, but as a subject, as a who, mm-hmm. as a person. And so understand God, just desperately trying and seeking God. And then on the other hand, turning around and looking at people whom this beggar already respects, identifies with, says, you are my people, I am with you. And tries to communicate in whatever way they can, hopefully with poetic conviction and beautiful language. This is where I found it. Come, join me in any way that they can be convincing. Right? Come. Mm-hmm. I, this is the this is the source. I don't know everything about the source, but I know I can get bread here, and you can too. Yeah. The image. I think this is Rick Warren. Maybe when talking about creating Sunday experiences for someone who has never encountered Jesus before. Warren, I think, used the image of a blind date. You're you're setting up your friend on a date with Jesus. And then from then on, that's like that's then it's up to Jesus to, to like be awesome at being on a date. <laughs> uh, you know? And the reason I think that's imp- an important counterpoint to my initial metaphor is that you get out of the way. Mm. Right? Like it's not like it's dependent on you. I was just talking about this with several different, several clients that I have as coaches, as coaching clients have said to me, hey, will you call me or email me tomorrow and check in to see if I did my homework? And I will often say to them, no, because it's not my job to create dependence on me. So who in your life can you ask for help about that? Because someday you're not going to be in coaching anymore and you're still going to need that kind of thing. 
and we brainstorm plans. And the idea is for me to get out of the way and let them live their life successfully. In the same way, I think we as introducers of people to Jesus need to make sure we get out of the way and let them connect with Jesus and do their thing and and let Jesus do his thing and not make it about us. Yeah. It's almost as though the goal is to make every single person into their own theologian. Not not that they get their uh, yes. own theology, but everybody needs to be their own theologian. Everybody needs to take God seriously as a subject and make it their life work to think and talk of God, full stop. And in order to under, to develop a knowledge and understanding of God in his being and work. Yes. I, I that absolutely. I I don't think I could come up with a better if that is how we're defining theologian, which is not how everybody would define theologian, but if that's what we're defining as theologian, I think we often would just define that as disciple. Sure. Sure. And so when we're discipling people, what better thing to do than to make people who do that? Yes. Well, and I love actually that he uses the word theologian here and kind of redefines it for us because I've heard so many people say, because, you know, once you get an MDiv, like people talk about it in weird ways and they're like, oh, so you're a theologian or you got a theology degree or oh, you're, you just like to talk theology all the time. or like, I don't know. So there's like all these really mixed up understandings of theology or doing theology. And most of the people I've talked to that say something like that make it feel like it's distant, remote, unattainable, very academic, and like a small percentage of people would qualify, would be interested, would – dive that far in? I don't know. So I love that Peterson radically redefines theologian and says, no, this is just taking God seriously and thinking and talking about him all the time. This is exactly it, right? He redefines theologian in a way that makes it open to everyone without watering it down. Yes. Yes. Because quite frankly, reading one verse a day is not taking God seriously. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if that's all I'm doing and that's where it's so easy with the language I grew up with and the way it worked in my brain. And I'm not saying anybody else thinks this or feels this way, but to think, did I do my quiet time? It's easy to read a verse and check mark it off. Yeah. But if I'm asking myself, how am I going to take God seriously today in what I say and what I do and what I think about, how am I going to take God seriously today? Yeah. That's a different way to start the day. It is. And I'm realizing, you know, it even changes how we pray. So yesterday, our pastor preached an amazing sermon on unanswered prayer. And he really treated the subject with a lot of grace and a lot of forthrightness and it just such good stuff. But he ended the sermon by asking, where's the hope in all of this? And his answer was that at its core, prayer never was about getting something from someone. It's about being with someone. Mm. And if we take God seriously as a subject and not as an object, say a genie or a dispenser of good things, then Prayer is about being with that subject, the one that we take seriously. It would mm -hmm. change everything. Well, and this is where I think we are led beautifully into this idea of the beggar as poet, to say that the person in the middle there is the, the beggar. Yeah. But the, the role of poetry, this idea of taking God seriously on the one hand and other individual persons seriously on the other hand. One of the things that modern poetry does is if you ever read, you know, I'm in the middle of working my way through T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. I've mentioned that a couple of times. It's an incredibly dense and difficult poem. And one of the reasons why correlates to one of the problems we often run into, I think, in Christianity in general. And that is that uh, in our 
Christian verbiage, words often begin to lose their meaning by overuse, right? Disciple, Christian, saved. Mm -hmm. And what Eliot is trying to do, what Eliot's argument is that it's not just Christian words that that happens to, it's all words. All of our words become right with overuse. And so modern poets are trying to put words together differently enough that it is jarring enough that we start to actually take reality seriously again. Hmm. And there is something really powerful on the one hand trying to take individual people seriously, and on the other hand trying to take God seriously that I think forces us if we want to do that in every generation to find new words and language as we almost rediscover for ourselves these truths. Yes, that's so true. I think analogies break down at some point, right? I think sometimes we need a little help grasping some of Jesus's analogies because we don't live in an agrarian society. And, mm -hmm. and so we don't immediately grasp the impact of some of what he's saying. So we have to put it into our own language and we have to put it into our own context. Not to say we have to rewrite the Bible. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we have to teach it, experience it in brand new ways that match our physical world, that help the invisible become visible in ways that we can grasp it today because we live in a very different time and space. Absolutely. Which requires, I think, a lot of patience for those of us who have gone through this process with those who are going through it now, right? Like, I can recall a moment where I had serious, very open questions about whether or not I believed in the Trinity as it was constituted theologically in evangelicalism. Mm. It wasn't that I was questioning the Bible. It was just that I was asking some questions about this truth that is invisible, that we have made visible by putting it into words. And I was curious if I thought we did so faithfully. Now, as a person who has kind of come to an answer on that question, how will I respond to the next person I meet who has the same set of questions? Yeah. And will I let... Are we allowed to have creative freedom in how we try to express the Bible's invisible truths? Like, there's something stuffy about an orthodoxy that says you have to say it the right way every time. And if you get it wrong, you're in trouble. And yet, the poetry of what Peterson is engaging with here seems to invite a creativity that might actually make some mistakes and then have to recorrect halfway through. Yeah. I actually, as I'm thinking about all this and how to communicate in ways that are moving and beautiful mm. and accurate and that resonate with current contemporary society, I feel like that is the essence of preaching. Mm -hmm. So much of preaching once you've done all of your homework about the text and you know what the text is saying, then it's finding the poetic wording to be able to communicate this, the stories that help illustrate it, the song lyrics that help communicate it, the existing poems that help give you metaphors and language whatever it is that you need in order to communicate this truth, I, honestly, I find it to be the most challenging part of preaching. Mm. And it's so unique to the individual. It's one of the things I love. Like I'm thinking about the pastor at, at the church my daughter goes to is this incredibly boisterous, outgoing, silly, delightful, really godly leader. And his sermons flow out of that personhood. Mm. The yeah. pastor at the church where I go to is a reserved, scholarly, deep 
and profound thinker. And his sermons are just as excellent, but completely different. Mm. Because art flows out of the individual's being. Yeah. I also am thinking about all of the different worship songs and the styles of worship music that we have all the way from the great hymns of previous generations to the many different types of praise and worship music we have. And obviously there's creative artistry going into all of that, but because of the poetic nature, the creative delivery of some of this content and the musicality of it, I feel like it often communicates better than a sermon because it just has more staying power. It has more imagination to it, or some of it does. Let's be frank. Some of these worship songs are wildly unimaginative, but those that have put their creative juices into them, they are powerful, powerful songs and they stick with us. Absolutely. And again, one may resonate with me and one may resonate with you and that's okay. It again finds me asking the question, where is the balance between being guardians of orthodoxy and inspirers of creativity as sons of our creator God and daughters of our creator God? Hmm. That's a fun challenge to hold. How did you put that? Inspirers of creativity and guardians of orthodoxy? Yeah, that sounds right. Let's go with that. I think that's a fun challenge. I would like to be in community with people who both want to inspire creativity and guard orthodoxy. That is a great community. Well, and to come back to where we started, I think that's what Peterson means by take seriously. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I would love to just turn to the audience and say, what have you resonated with in this conversation? Do you find yourself wanting to lean into becoming a better poet, a better theologian, a better pastor? Not the title of pastor in your local church, but a pastor that takes people seriously and listens to them. Where do you want to grow? What stands out to you and how can you take those next steps? And I'd encourage you to take this episode, share it with a friend, and have your own conversation about pastor, theologian, and poet. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. And practice being all three yourself. In what ways, based on what we're talking about here, are you a theologian? In what ways are you a poet? In what ways are you a pastor? It's not going to look the same for all of us. And the fact that Peterson is describing these as ways of understanding the, you know, John, the author of Revelation, doesn't mean everybody should be these things. However, I think that there is an open invitation that broadens what it means to be a disciple of Jesus to think about how these things intersect with each of our experiences of following Jesus. Mm, So good. Mm. Well, speaking of poetry, we get to move to our Summer in the Psalms series and pick up in our next reading section and find out what have you been thinking about with the Psalms. Okay. I I think this is from this week's section, but I just have to bring this up because I thought it was fascinating. Okay. This is from uh, Psalm 48, verse 9. And again, since we've talked about Peterson the entire episode— I'm just going to pick a thought that is a way that Peterson translates in the message that blew my mind. Okay. And this is a very important concept in the Psalms, which is the covenant faithfulness of God, right? This this idea that translators constantly have difficulty knowing exactly what to say. (laughs) Yes. And... In Psalm 48, 9, Peterson calls it God's love in action. Hmm. And to think of 
this idea of God's faithfulness, his engaging in covenant, his constant loyalty to the, the covenants that he has made, to think of it as the way that God interacts with the world that is based on his essential nature as a loving being. This is the way God does love covenants. This is the way God does love by making agreements and keeping them. Mm -hmm. I just thought there was so much wealth in trying to capture that idea in this phrase that again, like we were, I was talking about, about Eliot forces us to shake off kind of our right assumption that we know what these words are about. I was just so grateful for it. I It makes me wonder if we move over to Psalm 136, does he say his love in action endures forever? Oh, I don't know, but we can get there eventually. 136. Okay. It says his love never quits. Okay. I don't know if I like that as much, but okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know that I do either, but I certainly loved this idea of covenant as love in action. Yeah. And I, I just, whew. what about you? What, if, what struck you as you were reading the Psalms this week? You know, I was fully prepared to come into this episode and say, I don't have any thoughts. And I don't know if this is actually a thought or just an excuse as to why I don't have any thoughts. But mm -hmm. as I've been reading the Psalms lately, so many of them, and this is true all throughout the Psalter, so many of them have dealt with, I got enemies on all sides, God, you got to help me. And wow, God, you came through for me. You saved my life. And yay. And I'm just struggling to connect with the Psalms under with that concept i don't know like david was one harassed dude like i've never met anybody that feels like he's got enemies all around him all the time and that they're trying to lay in wait for him they're trying to trick him they're sneering at him they're jeering at him they think uh you know anything we can do to get this guy like it's very, very descriptive. And I'm going, this is not my life. Like I've dealt with some nasty people, but then I'm like, move on. And I don't engage with those nasty people anymore. This just seems to be a whole battle that is fought over and over and over in the Psalms. And I don't relate to it one drop. And so I'm like, I have no thoughts. I don't know what I'm supposed to think from all of this. That's fair. I, if we could... And with the aid of our audience, if as many of them as possible could make a long-term commitment to sending you hate mail, uh, <laughs> I, thought, I, I think that would help. I thought this was going to be like, hey, help help Josh from Oregon out. Tell him how he should understand these Psalms. And instead, you're like completely the opposite direction. Just send him hate mail. He'll figure it out. Well, if yeah, I'm just trying to help you have enemies. I'm a helpful friend. I think there was a psalm about like, I could handle it if it was my enemies, but like you, my good friend, you betrayed me. And now I don't know what to I'm do. I'm not going to send you hate mail. They're going to send you hate mail. Oh, don't get I out of I am going to support that's, you in the pain that you experience when they send you hate mail. That's like hiring a hitman and then doing chest compressions when they uh, like kill you. Fair point. <laughs> Fair point. Okay. Well. If you were already going to send him hate mail, do that. But if you were going to do it because of me, maybe I need to back off and say, please don't do that. But seriously, I do get where you're coming from. Uh, it, there are some times in the Psalms, and I think theologically this is okay. It's okay to say that prayer does not resonate with where I'm at right now. But I think even beyond that, like I don't even know, I mean, I hope. I don't even know that I will ever feel this way. I, I just feel like this is so remote to my existence. Like, I don't even feel the need to tuck this in my back pocket for later. Yeah, no, I, I think I think for some of us, our response to Psalms like that is, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not in that context. Yeah. 
and I, I think that's okay. And a reminder, you know, I, I feel like I said something similar to this last year as well. A reminder that the Psalter isn't all about me. It's about us. Mm. And us is far broader than I sometimes remember. Yeah, that's true. I feel like one of our hopes for Summer in the Psalms is that we encourage folks to actually dive into the Psalms and read them for themselves and experience them. And I feel like all I'm doing is like, yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. So like, I don't. But I think that's good. Man, the last thing I want is for people to like, I, and I don't, I think when people try to read the Bible with the wrong set of expectations, it like becomes spiritually constipating. Mm, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it it's horrible. It's far better to say, man, read it, respond to it. However you respond to it, it's great. Then read another one tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm definitely on the read another one tomorrow bandwagon this week. Well, well, man, are you ready for another one of something completely different? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do a witch Josh. All right. I am so excited because this week's witch Josh is which Josh now knows how cavemen felt. Hmm. That is me. Yes. So please tell me, I, I have so many potential storylines going on in my head right now. Please tell me what happened. So the other day, I this is actually a continuation of a story that I began sharing on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. So my running lawnmower quit. And oh yeah, I would try to like start it and drive and it would, I would go a few feet and then it would stop. And then I would turn it over again and it would go a few feet and then it would stop. And it just would not stay running. And then eventually like on the third or fourth try, like I couldn't even get it to start anymore. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on with this thing? I am not a mechanic, but taking it all the way into town sounded like ridiculous and expensive and like, I've got to find a way to fix this. So I researched it and it was like, you, you know, replace your gas lines. So I replaced all the gas lines. I got it all like snaked, you know, because the gas tank's on one side and the engine's on the other. So you got to snake it through the chassis and all that stuff. Did that, replaced the fuel filter. And lo and behold, it runs and it stays running. And I just felt like I conquered the world. I came Ooh. back in the house and I was like, I don't know how the caveman felt when they made fire, but when they first made fire and they accomplished something, it felt exactly like this. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. That's how a caveman felt. Like I did that. Whoa. Beat your chest, crow, grunt. I don't know what you have to do. I don't know what the caveman did. Maybe they hit something with a club. It just felt good. If only hitting your lawnmower with a club had worked. <laughs> right. But, well, man, congratulations. I know that feeling. Whenever I am not good with mechanical things of any kind. And so whenever I successfully accomplish anything in that sphere, I feel that exact same way. I'm like, hey, look, I'm the awesomest person in the world. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because exactly. I plunged my toilet <laughs> or whatever stupid little thing I've done. Yeah. 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 You had so much anxiety going into it because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. totally ill-equipped for this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, we're at least equipped to chat at each other once a week. So should we do that again? Let's do it next week. I can't wait. All right. Talk to you later. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.